All right. Um, tonight we will be looking at uh, Gradeproof and Flippity, which are add-ons from Google. If you are fluent with how to do that, um, you could download those at any time. Um, Checkmark is an extension, and we will be talking people through how to do that. But if you want to get a jump on it, you are welcome to do so. Um, there's already a, a sample document link in the chat post as well, and we'll be feeding that with some more things as needed. But we just wanted to give people a heads up on that one. All right. Welcome to this interactive webinar on taking Google Basics to the next level with transformational technology tools. My name is Leanne Schmidt, and I am a secondary classroom teacher currently in writing in US history as well as being a doctoral candidate at Central Michigan University um, in the Doctor of Educational Technology program. Please join me in welcoming my colleague in the DET program, Colleen Hometh. Hello, my name is Colleen Hometh. I am a professor at Central Michigan University in the College of Education. I work with pre-student teachers, teaching methods courses and observing them teach in the local school district classroom. I also work with seniors as their um, as they tutor local elementary students in our on-campus reading clinic. I am also a doctoral student at CMU in the Doctor of Educational Technology program. Leanne and I look forward to sharing some technology tools with you that will enhance teacher feedback with your students. And as she mentioned, this would be a good time to add on the, the Google um, extensions if you haven't already done that. All right. Because we recognize the value of educators' time, our goal is to provide efficiency improvements and streamline classroom processes through the use of Google-based interactive technology tools. We will connect Google Docs usage on two new tools for student feedback, followed by a brief exploration on security concerns with student data. Next, we will use Google Sheets as a gateway to additional tools available through Flippity, and as a bonus, show you how spreadsheet data can expedite usage of the multiple resources available through Quizlet. At each juncture, we will offer sandbox time for participants to explore the uses of the tools themselves with the opportunity to ask questions. However, before we get started with those tools, we'd like to introduce you to Tim, the Technology Integration Matrix. This is Tim, the Tim Framework, Technology Integration Matrix. Tim is a common language for technology integration in professional development. In an effort to maintain standards and accountability, Tim has been created as a teacher resource. This framework offers several resources. The Professional Learning Division offers a variety of options and resources for professional learning that can be customized to meet the needs of schools, districts, or state educational agencies. Their own professional development and evaluation staff have decades of experience in teaching K-12 technology, district-level planning, evaluation, and research. The Matrix provides a framework for describing and targeting the use of technology to enhance learning. You will see several charts that integrate this matrix with this, within this presentation. We've developed this webinar wise guide to show how SAMR, IIE, and ISTE, which you are probably already familiar with, come together fluently to join Tim in an effort to develop a perfect blend of scaffolding lessons from entry level technology experiences toward higher level thinking skills. Flippity identifies with all of these areas with a list of challenge tasks. As students select a topic to practice skills, they are at the active level actively engaged in the tools as a learning process instead of passively receiving information. At this level of technology use, the student articulates and sets personal goals, developing strategies to achieve them, reflecting on the learning process as part of ISTE's first area, uh, the number one area, empowered learner. This learning process also meets the substitution level of SAMR as it can directly replace paper pencil skills. As the student explores further into the concept, functional improvements could possibly take place, identifying with augmentation, 
with the same given skill. Me, okay, I'm sorry about that. Tim provides a framework of technology student learning levels. I will describe five attributes of learning environments, then we will move on to five levels of technology integration that this framework employs. The matrix also consists of five levels of technology integration, allowing for a scaffolding of challenges. At the entry level, going from the top across, uh, at this level, technology tools are introduced by the teacher. Rules are applied, instructors go over the importance of how it enhances, not driven by, but enhances the learning environment. In Flippity, and yes, I keep referring to Flippity because that's my tech tool, the other tech tools will be um, applied to all these areas too or any other tech tool, this would be the stage where the teacher first introduces what his purpose is and how the student is to use it safely and effectively. The next level is adoption. The teacher explains the conventions and procedures in how this, um, of the tool. In Flippity, the students begin to understand the process of the operations as it continues to become a learning tool. The adaptation tool, which is the third level, um, the teacher becomes a facilitator. Now the student understands the use and purpose of the tool and gets to start exploring it independently. <clears throat> a little bit more on their own. When students have trouble reading, sometimes we have an audio book for them to read along at, at our reading clinic. And um, that would be an example of this adaptation level. Students are given freedom to create and apply knowledge through games such as crossword puzzles and hangman that you will um, experience later on through uh, Flippity. The fourth area is infusion. Teachers provide the learning activity. The student chooses the technology. Now that the students have explored their options of activity, they're a little bit more independent and can go choose their own games. Last but not least is the transformational level. This stage encourages innovative use of the technology tool. It allows and requires higher order thinking skills to be applied that may not be possible without the use of technology. Although Flippity does tend toward the lower levels of Tim, there are options to create games that a student may not be able to develop without the use of this tool, especially through um, teacher um, direction and encouragement. Uh, the first area um, of the um, attributes of the learning environment um, down here we have five areas, and the first area is the active area, as you can see by the runner next to the word active. Students are engaged in using technology as a tool rather than passively receiving information. They are actively involved. In Flippity, a student would be engaged in this level of learning as they are invo involved with the flashcard partner challenge. Next, we have the collaborative level. Students use technology tools to collaborate with others frequently in Flippity. Um, they work together quite often in collaboration in, in partnerships or uh, groups of two or three or even um, small groups to whole groups. And um, then we go on to the constructive level. Students use the technology to, to connect new information to their prior knowledge rather than passively receiving that information. Once again, in Flippity, students can create or play games applying their knowledge and, or incorporating that prior knowledge to build on new skills to be learned in a scaffolding effect. The fourth one is authentic. Students use technology tools to link learning activities to the world beyond the instructional, center, um, instructional setting of the classroom. Rather than working with decontextualized assignments, they really get to um, make a real life um, connection in, in that area. And then of course, we're at the goal directed. Students use the technology tools to set goals. Um, plan activities, monitor progress, and evaluate results rather than simply completing assignments without reflection. Reflection is always necessary and that provides an opportunity for awesome um, teacher feedback as well as student feedback. In Flippity, the data collection system can be utilized for planning and goal setting within that um, teacher-student feedback. Let's get specific about one of the areas of this um, breakdown of Tim. Breaking down the Tim fra framework a bit more, we can take a closer look at the active level. Entry is the most basic level of tech discovery down on, on, on the bottom. The adoption level covers technology procedure use, adaptation, 
provides further exploration. As you can see, we're scaffolding on up to more independent learning. And as the um, levels go up, it goes from uh, teacher directed to student interaction and student control, um, leading all, all the way up to um, student um, learning specifically. Okay, um, the infusion allows student choice and independence. And finally, the transformational level allows for the skill in ways that students may not be able to accomplish without the technology. Leanne will explain to you how her tech tool applies to these and other standards today as well. We will model how each tech tool presented today applies to all of these areas and allow time for you to practice these tech tools and think for yourself how your skills in your classrooms would apply to these standards and tools as well. And now Leanne will discuss the value of Google Docs. I remember the first time I came into school as a substitute teacher returning after more than 10 years away from the classroom and finding EdTech and Google awaiting me. I was mesmerized when I saw students working in a group project and doing live time edits on a document. Three years later, I was a Google certified educator. Google has transformed collaboration in the classroom. While Microsoft Office products still maintain a market share, Google's functionality for simplicity and collaboration eclipses the old standby. Even when Microsoft purports to offer collaboration, such as the collaboration space in OneNote, the response time lag and failures to sync data can frustrate any user, no matter how patient. Google, which began as a search engine, was founded with a marketing mindset. This has caused developments, acquisitions, and innovations of the industry, which moved in the direction of free online platforms for daily usage of applications. Why offer a word processor and spreadsheet program for free so that users become followers? Once they're hooked, they will continue to loyally use your products. That is not to say Google Docs has all the functionality of Microsoft Office or of OpenOffice, another free platform, but it offers a majority of the common functions as well as the benefit of being nimble and profoundly collaborative. This is the Google difference. The current generation of students are being taught in a primarily Google environment with more Microsoft and alternative options during the high school and graduate years. The same students will Google everything and seek answers and entertainment on YouTube, another Google platform. This is the common marketing model. Our first tool to share is Gradeproof with AI, a grammar checker for writing assignments with bonus features. As my students type their essays into Google Docs, it's common to see markups for basic errors, but the Google AI coaching usually ends there, leaving students on their own regarding grammar. I could spend 15 minutes per student essay marking every grammatical mistake in addition to content issues. Of course, 15 minutes times 25 students per class times three classes equals almost 19 hours per graded assignment. Yikes. I'd much rather have Gradeproof identify the errors for students and establish the classroom expectation that students must address each notification before submitting completed work. Let's get started with the Google Docs platform. If you're not already using Google Docs, please go to docs.google.com to do so. If you use Google Chrome, please click the nine square apps button in the um, upper left-hand corner and select Google Docs from the menu. You're more than welcome to sidestep that pathway and just click the sample document that Colleen put into the chat uh, platform for us. And that will take you right where you need to go. You will need to make a copy of your own in order to get started with it. To get Gradeproof with AI, a downloadable version is available from gradeproof.com if you prefer to use other word processing programs 
but I use the Google Docs add-on because my students are more comfortable with, with Google Docs. In a Google Doc, just go to the Get Add-ons button uh, at the top, and um, from the drop-down menu, and then you will go to Grade Proof. You have to type that in the search box. And then it gives you the option um, to click the blue button, which says plus free on it, to select the add-on. As a first-time user, you might have a couple other screens to go through, but I will go on and introduce um, other features of Grade Proof while you are um, getting that downloaded. To engage Gradeproof with AI, just go back to that same add-ons menu and select Gradeproof with AI and then start. On the right of your screen, an analysis block will appear. It looks just like that one. The crucial aspect of Gradeproof is demonstrated by the color-coded section at the top of the block. However, check out the bonus under statistics. The first five callouts share data, but only the word count is outwardly valuable to students. I encourage teachers to walk through readability to show how the score is derived. When I do the same with grade level, I need to clarify for students that years refers to grade in school, not age. Even at that, some of my students asked, does this mean that I write like a fourth grader? I asked what might raise that grade level. Students responded with longer words, mm, more syllables, and better sentences. We talked about adding clauses and complexity to sentences. It was a great conversation, which was triggered by these analytics, giving students the motivation to drive improvement in their own work before it gets submitted to me for grading. Don't forget speaking time when assigning students to write a speech. If Gradeproof says it's a five-minute speech, then it's okay. There's no ambiguity. This should be the look that you're seeing on um, the analysis screen. Spelling and grammar checking works basically like uh, word processing programs that you would normally see by underlining the trouble spot and then providing information to students when they click there. During the trial period or with the paid version, the green marks for advanced grammar and the blue notations for eloquence function the same way. However, my students use the free version and I guide them to look at the, the green and blue marks as pointers to sentences that ne they need to read and revise on their own. If they can't recognize the error, they can check with a person at their table. And after other avenues have been exhausted, they know they can raise a hand for a quick conference with me to guide them in the right direction. Another bonus, Adjustments that students make result in real-time changes to the statistics, which allows them to work toward an improvement goal. Like the students that I have who want to write above their grade level, showing off, yes, but it also offers differentiation so that advanced students are still learning while others are fixing simpler mistakes. Through the lens of the SAMR model, Gradeproof surpasses substitution by offering augmentation simply through identification of syntax and eloquence elements, which the basic word processors do not. Students using the analytics to level up their own writing with real-time feedback on changes demonstrate modification. Redefinition is possible with the right assignment. Applying ISTE standards, my students can become computational thinkers by analyzing data for informed solutions. 
They advance as creative communicators by using digital resources to transform original works into new creations and publishing content customized for their intended audience. I am loving Gradeproof, which empowers students to improve their own writing with real-time quality data, leaving me to guide, coach, and emphasize content. I hope that everyone has had a chance to get that add-on and open the sample Google Doc that was posted. Now it's time for you to give it a try on your own. Our goal is that you will spend the next several minutes putting this resource through its paces and trying it in ways that might fit your needs. Colleen and I will be right here to respond to questions that you might have about situations that you encounter while you're using Gradeproof. Okay. Any questions out there? I will also be tossing in, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna see if you were gonna offer a kind of a time frame for them for their sandbox time. Okay, we're looking at about four minutes here for the sandbox time. So you really do have time to play and get working with it. I will be throwing out some ideas just to inspire you with a variety of applications that might get your creative juices flowing for curriculum development. So mainly we want you to use the sandbox time to wiggle your toes and get the feel of it and see what impressions are possible. Uh, personally, I get frustrated with workshops where I sit for 50 minutes hearing about how to do something taking notes and then I return to the classroom saying when I get some time I'll have to check that out which never actually happens. Leanne quick question. Sure. Um, so mine popped up and said you know oh, here we're offering you a free seven-day trial of Gradeproof Pro and so I clicked on it to see what it opened up for me. Um, and the plagiarism checker is still not part of Gradeproof Pro. Um, have you looked into the cost at all of some of the institution or school-wide licenses? The costs I found to be relatively high and it was it was not something I was quite ready to budget. Uh, the plagiarism checker is something that is in development so I would suggest waiting a bit before jumping into something like that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I did find with the paid version of it is it just gives more explanation for uh, the eloquence and the advanced grammar, which yes, they were helpful to my students, but I think they also have the opportunity to create a crutch so that they don't learn that aspect of grammar. They just expect to be told what to fix, then they do it, and they don't think about what they're doing. So um, forcing them to do it with some of those features really helps their learning. Oh, and a special note to cohort five in case you want to put your um, EDU 802 papers through this. Um, there is a limit of 20 pages that it will process at any one time, but viable solution is to make a copy of it and then do half and half and it will analyze it for you. Um, Leanne, Tammy Kolsky is asking, what grade levels do you think best help this best helps with? Well, I use it with my seventh graders. The basic grammar things, I think you could easily use even with third, fourth, fifth graders in elementary school. Um, and the, the analytics that it offers, I do check my own writing with it to see if there are little things that I've missed because 
You know, we can all be reading our writing, which is familiar to us, and miss a word or miss a, a misspelling. So I, I use it myself. So I would say anywhere from third grade on up could easily use this. I wonder, Leanne, as you're getting ready to transition, could you talk for just a moment how um, even with the free version, I know you mentioned this in your screencast, you, you do have students go back and look at like issues of eloquence and things like that or advanced grammar. You'd mentioned that you confer with them on those advanced issues. Maybe you could talk about that quickly before we transition. Sure. Um, well, I have students who have some experience in using the Grammarly program as well. And I think this has its similarities. Uh, personally, when I, when I work with the, the two programs at the same time, I, I am very careful with my words and I find that Grammarly and, and the suggestions that it offers have a tendency to annoy me because they make my writing bland but I don't have the same kind of philosophical differences with this one. So when my students are making their adjustments, I'm always very careful to you know, obviously guide them through the corrections of grammar that need to be made. But I also let them know that there are some choices that writers make in the way that they, they um, craft their writing that a grammar checker like this may suggest to simplify it, to shorten a sentence, to do something. And if they feel like their word choice is something that they feel strongly about, and that if what I tell them is, if you would want to get into a conversation with me and explain why what you're doing is the right thing to have the right impact on your audience, then you're probably right in leaving it there because we are still dealing with AI, which has some automatic responses for people, but it's not, it's not perfect. And it, it doesn't have the human consciousness to make that change. So, um, and we should probably be transitioning onto the next tool by now. So if you could wrap up what you are testing out there on Gradeproof, we hope you enjoyed learning about it um, and want to move on this time to Checkmark, which is a Chrome extension for providing one-touch comments. And the icon is up here in the upper right, so that's what you will be looking for. Um, you know, color me crazy but I don't love a class load of homework to grade. I like it even less as a stack of papers, but digital files flooding my Dropbox are extremely daunting. As a language arts teacher, I like the facility of using Google Docs for feedback comments to students, but the work of posting all those comments can be time consuming. Others have suggested that um, it's a good idea to pick a few types of errors to address on each assignment to limit the scope and then to rotate those so that all of them are covered. But that really doesn't feel genuine to me if I leave errors unaddressed. With Checkmark, I can post the same comment 12 times throughout an assignment or 12 different comments in just the time that it takes to highlight a word or phrase and click once. Seriously, just tapping my keyboard one time will post, check your MLA document header, which should have your name, my name, class name, and date without me needing to type anything. Even though Checkmark works with Google Docs, um, it is only available as a Chrome extension, not an add-on. And for the first month, I found this a little bit confusing. 
the extensions are across the, the top band of your browser, and the add-ons are within Google Docs itself. Um, and I kept wanting to go to the add-ons menu to make changes instead of looking for that little check mark symbol, uh, the same one that you see right down here, which is in my, um, at the top of my screen all the time now. So in order to get checkmark, which is free, you need to go to chrome.google.com and click extensions and then type checkmark, all one word, in the search feature. And then it, uh, checkmark should pop up there and you will have uh, the opportunity to add to Chrome by clicking a button, clicking the blue button. Um, and please go ahead and do that. I am going to get out of present mode here for a moment. And I need to toggle check mark on because it can get a little bit annoying sometimes if I'm highlighting other things. All right, here's how it works. Ah, a spelling error. Uh, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Let's try this out again. It worked fine in the demo. <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea is, this is that this is really quick. And uh, eventually it will be. Okay. That's how fast you can do it. Check spelling. And there it is. So what I do is highlight, go to my translucent keyboard, which pops up. And um, I've got a whole range of comments that I can post. Each key has a particular comment, and as I hover over it, you can see the language for each one. This row at the bottom is a row that I have added as um, custom features because we use um, MLA format at school, and I am commonly making corrections in that with that for the students. So let me do the spelling error. That was just that one click on the S. So the comments just post automatically, which um, actually is when I click, a script engages, which creates a comment window in the margin, types the text, and posts it. But all I've actually done is just click that S on the visual keyboard with my mouse. I only have to move my hand enough to highlight and click the mouse button. So I'm not actually typing on my physical keyboard, which reduces time and repetitive moment, movements. So here's another spelling error. I could also be saying something about their title at the bottom. Okay. And you might notice that little bonus feature with those red tallies over there, the circles. When the same comment is posted numerous times, the, the red circle keeps count. This allows me to easily see which problems are perpetual for a student and which may be just a simple oversight in case I want to grade them differently. If this default bank of comments doesn't fit your needs, You can click the menu up here and make any changes. You can click edit and add additional comments with the plus sign. Or if the way that these are stated doesn't really fit your voice as a teacher, the things that students would recognize from you, you can just change any of the language by retyping it in there. 
you always need to remember to save your work. Yeah, I added this one when I was playing around with it. I'm going to delete that and that. So it doesn't accidentally show up sometime. And like I said, this is the, the row that I added on my own. And you do that by clicking the plus up here. And you can just begin adding any instructions that you want. Another feature is that you can create a custom class so that if you teach different grade levels or um, different subject areas and you have a different comment bank for each one of them, uh, you can make that fit each class and then you don't have to see all of the comments for everything all at the same time. So. If you get annoyed with that pop-up window, like I mentioned, um, you can always toggle it off and back on again. It just lights up or grays out in the upper margin. Now at the outset, I will say without reservation that this tool is less for my students' skill development than for the self-serving goal of saving my time. However, if my alternative is to either limit my comments to manage the load or overloading myself every time an assignment occurs, that does impact my students. First, in getting less feedback and second, in sizable delays in response. So when the Triple E Evaluation Framework by Liz Kolb looks at tools which create supports to make it easier to understand concepts and ideas, I can definitely add a check mark. Likewise, I'm fulfilling my ISTE standards for educators, criteria 7B, as I use technology to design and implement a variety of formative and summative assessments that provide timely feedback to students and inform instruction. I'm also supporting students in their use of tech tools with Google Docs, posting and responding to comments, and maybe even creating criteria of their own. The time savings, consistency, and transparency that Checkmark offers me in providing feedback comments to students is amazing. So we will now take some time for you to jump back in the sandbox and see how Checkmark works for you. I think we're probably going to hold it to about three minutes. Remember that your brain's processed ideas so much better when you're actually using them, so um, give it a try. Are there any comments or uh, questions? I just want to double check and make sure that everybody got it installed okay. I know at least uh, one person was having a little bit of trouble. It seems like everybody has got a uh, check mark good to go. I thought I had mine installed, but it's not doing anything like what's on the screen here in the presentation. And I, I'm wondering if it's, I'm on a Mac. Is anybody, anybody doing things different for that? <laughs> I have not tried it on a Mac. Colleen, have you tried it? Um, I've not tried this particular one, no, sorry. Okay, we will have to do some more testing on that one then. So, Is it? It shows, it shows that check mark drop down box and the little check mark at the top, but it won't let me click on anything or do anything with it. And I can't get the other thing where you had the little um, transparent keyboard to pop up. Have you tried refreshing your document? Might depend. Uh, I'll try that. <laughs> Interestingly enough, when I tried checkmark at home, it worked, but now that I'm here on campus, I'm getting a little warning that says something about your browser or your network may be blocking it. 
Mm -hmm. And then I clicked on their help guide and it said, if you cannot save comments or they disappear, that means the checkmark server is blocked. Please ask your district school IT folks to unblock the following IP address. So you, that might be the problem. It also just suggests doing a full restart of Google Chrome. So just shutting down your browser and starting again. So it could okay. be a number of different things. Here, I'll throw the support link here in the chat room. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, I will also add that uh, checkmark comments can include any text that you would like to add. Um, and that could include the plus mention feature. Then if you've never used this feature, you um, what you would need to do is open a comment box and um, type plus and send one to myself, add an email address, and then you can type any text such as uh, please fix this and assign it. And once I click that button, it will trigger an email to the person that's mentioned along with a file link so that you can uh, attend to the highlighted portion of the document. And when I was participating in committees uh, to submit certification reports to Isaacs, we used this feature to notify the enrollment office that we needed some student data to fill in the reports that we were doing and also to notify club moderators that we needed a picture to insert here and there uh, for a recent event to showcase our um, programs. So if you use the if you use the plus mention feature and embed it into checkmark you can actually create a referral system for yourself that could save some email drafting time. And I hope those ideas are flowing for you. Uh, we'll be wrapping up in less than a minute. So I'm actually going to move back into present mode. So as we draw to a close, if you've been editing the keyboard options, be sure that you save those. And uh, although I'm a strong advocate of Google resources, it's always a wise stance to be mindful of open platforms and more and more add-ons and extensions which connect our students to commercial entities on the web. So that we have um, and also to show that we are modeling some good digital citizenship for the young people in our care. On that note, I'll turn the screen over to Colleen for some words about student data security. Thank you, Leanne, and I hope everybody had fun in the sandbox. <laughs> now moving on to uh, the student data security. As we all know, technology is absolutely necessary in the classroom. But above and beyond that, um, our top priority is um, student data security. While integrating technology into the classroom is necessary to enhance classroom pedagogy and achieve learning goals, student privacy protection is top priority for all of us. I will now discuss security measures taken by Google, as well as a specific student policy adopted by top companies that we are all familiar with. The first one, as you can see on the screen, is FERPA. I'm sure um, all of you have heard of this. Google protects student privacy through FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. This is a federal law that protects the privacy of student records. The law applies to all schools that receive funds under an applicable, applicable program of the United States Department of Education. The other one is COPA. Google also commits to COPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. 
This law imposes certain requirements on operators of websites or online services directed to children aged 13 years and younger and, and on operators of other websites or online services that collect personal information from children under age 13. Google um, Drive, which lets users have a single account that accesses all their documents, has switched its services to HTTPS, the, service, the secure version of HTTP. This server type, used by banks and shopping carts, makes all communication between the website and your browser encrypted, so no one can see what you're doing. However, your data is less secure at rest, so be aware of that, which means that when it's just sitting there, it's not encrypted. To help keep your data a bit safer, you can add another layer of security by turning on two-step verification or Google Drive, or for Google Drive and getting a security key for it. Here is our um, specific um, student pledge that we are very um, anxious to share with you, the student privacy pledge components. Specific to classroom teachers is the student privacy pledge. This was created by Software Information Industry, known as SIIA, to protect classroom students. As, as you can see throughout the screen, this company and anyone who signs this pledge commits to not using or disclosing student information collected through an education, school, educational or school functioning building or um, of any advertisements to students. This pledge, if you, if you have signed it, you also commit to not making material changes to school service provider consumer privacy policies without first providing prominent notice to the account holder. <clears throat> the parent student with the information collected directly from the student with um, parent student content, co consent and allowing them choices before data is used in any manner inconsistent with terms they were initially provided and not make material changes to other policies governing the use of student personal information that are inconsistent with contractual requirements. And one other thing that they do not allow is not know knowingly retain student personal information beyond the time period required to support the educational purpose or authorized by students and parents. So as soon as the educational um, system is being removed, then um, obviously the student information is no longer available even to the company that has supported that system. They do maintain, if you sign this pledge, a comprehensive security program that is reasonable to protect the security, privacy, confidentiality, and integrity of student information against, against risks such as unauthorized access or use or unintended to inappropriate disclosure through the use of administrative, technological, and physical safeguards appropriate to the sensitivity of the information. And they also commit to requiring that the vendors involved with whom student personal information is shared in order to deliver the educational service are obligated to implement the same commitments and same security systems. Now there are a list, a huge list of very um, popular companies and programs and technology systems across our country that use this um, pledge and have committed to this pledge already. I will simply mention a few companies that you would be most um, familiar with. The AT&T company uses this pledge. Blackboard signs this pledge. Apple, ABC Mouse, and the Class Dojo technology tool which is also a very common tool used in our local community schools. Um, ed, ed, edgenuity, Edmodo is another common tool used in our local schools. Education framework, Flocabulary, Google for Education clearly uses it. Khan Academy, McGraw-Hill Education, Microsoft, Seesaw and Storybird, just to name a few. So it is a very seriously um, taken commitment and it is well used and highly um, honored as a privacy program for our young students. And now Leanne will share more on Google Sheets. Okay. Um, if you are not already a user of Google Sheets, please go to sheets.google.com to do so. Um, you can also look at that nine square apps button in the upper left hand corner, sometimes called the waffle, and uh, click on Google Sheets from that drop down menu. 
And um, we will also be putting a Google Sheet link into the chat box in just a moment to um, get you doing that. And uh, I would just turn the screen over to Colleen. Just a second here. Okay. I'll be ready for that in just a sec. Yep. I am trying to um, get my, not coming up now. I'm trying to get my links onto the chat and my chat's not popping up. Oh, I'll take care of the link if you want to just go ahead. Okay. Oops. Minor technical difficulties here, just a second. No, I don't want to leave the meeting. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the link is in the chat box right now. If you want to click on that link, it just gives you um, some prepped data. One is a class list and uh, second page of that is a quick vocabulary list. Okay, so the technology tool Flippity is what I'm about to um, show you. And um, as I'm talking to it, I can, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. As I'm talking about it, I would actually first like to um, show you how to get on it. You go to um, Google Docs. And then you click on spreadsheets. You choose one. And then you click on add-ons. Oh, they're still loading, hold on. Clicking on add-ons. And then you click get add-ons. Maybe we need to do that again. And this is what you will have on your sheet. You will type in Flippity right in this box, and that is how you will get yours. And um, I'm trying to move my thing over here. But since I already have mine, I will go to Flippity. And um, then after you get yours, then you come back to add-ons, click on Flippity and choose pick a template. And this is how you begin um, to actually um, explore the uh, game of Flippity. This technology tool Flippity is a series of web apps that can easily turn a Google spreadsheet into a set of online flashcards or quiz show. It creates flashcards for study and assessment feedback purposes, surveys and more. Flippity has 16 apps free to the public. Each app has a demonstration, instructions, and template to build your own format, meaning that you can bring in your own curriculum and connect your own standards. The easy to follow instructions and formatting is quick, which makes Flippity popular among teachers. The options range from simple flashcard creations to more complex game show styles. Students and teachers can keep track of their progress, and knowledge level through the badge tracker, and it also uh, is a good source of um, student feedback. The apps can be used online from any classroom or home. Okay, so um, if you are going through the actual um, choices, um, you have many different games and many different activities that are very engaging to students. And some of them are quite um, collaborative. Some of them are very specific to um, individual feedback. What I like about the uh, tech tool that I've chosen is it is more specific to teacher verbal interacting during the lesson kind of feedback, whereas Leanne's is written feedback. So we um, thought that it would be great to show you two times, two different ways of specific teacher feedback. One was written um, with Leanne and this one is more verbal interactive during the lesson. Of course, all scavenger hunts are, are a fun thing to do. Um, this one is the random name picker where you can spin. I, ha I happen to have a class list available in the chat um, box. I hope it made it. 
Um, if you want to copy and paste that into your Flippity, you can actually um, try to make one of these yourself. And what you do is you spin it. This is more of a classroom management system, which is also very good for teacher feedback. Um, what it does is it spins different random names um, quite often a teacher will get used to calling on the same students even though we don't intentionally do it or we call on students with their hands raised and quite often those are the same students. We want to make sure that we're reaching the quiet students off in the corner all, or the other students who just don't want to share anything so that we give them feedback as well as um, them being able to um, express their knowledge to us as well. So this flippity name picker um, breaks up your um, names into many different ways. It either helps you to identify a student to call on, or it gives a single name. And it also creates a lineup, which is obviously very um, um, practical if you're in a lower elementary class and um, giving them places to stand. It also creates good grouping sets which um, makes for time management. And, and if you happen to have a game or an activity where you got to get quickly into groups and the students are fighting over who they're going to have or what they're going to be, who they're going to be with, the teacher can easily click on one of these up on the um, smart board or up on the projector and say, all right, wherever you, your name is, jump into those groups. And so it really does provide a wonderful um, classroom management system. And also it provides a uh, seating chart too. Hey, as you can see, there are many different ways to apply terms such as science concepts or um, vocabulary words. Um, you can make it fun with all of the different um, word um, configurations that they come up with. You can make a social studies timeline or um, history timeline. This flip the badge tracker, um, this is how they earn points as they gain um, winnings throughout their, their um, strategies and their collaboration. And that also actually helps to provide feedback as well. Uh, Flippity spelling words, a really fun way to um, incorporate spelling, um, typing test. This Flippity crossword um, is something I would like to show you here. One of the rare moments, there we go. One of the rare activities that does not allow you to play this online. This is print only. However, it actually provides a good opportunity for you to um, add your own concepts and your own vocabulary terms or whatever for a, a substitute teacher um, activity. Um, easy to use, easy to follow directions, and with your own skills involved, you know that even while you're away from the classroom, learning is still happening in an engaging way. So that one is a, a good example. Um, of course, who doesn't like a good word, word search? We have those. Um, Flippity bingo is always a big hit as well. And then we have Flippity Hangman, which is fun. Now, I like to choose this one because um, with my work in the reading clinic, I work with at-risk students who are um, needing to know um, word, um, word spellings, beginning sounds, ending sounds, and word chunking, things like that. Um, quite often in our reading clinic, if they, um, the students get their work done, they beg their student teachers to allow them to do hangman on the dry erase boards. It's just a fun and engaging way for them to um, continue their, their lessons. And obviously, you just type a letter in there. Whoops, I already did that one. You uh, type a letter in there, and you click return, and hopefully you don't get hung like I did over the weekend while I was practicing this. Oh, I've got an, a letter R. Now these come from vocabulary terms or concepts and skills that they are already familiar with. So you present the idea of the theme first and then they can go through and figure out um, what letter or what word they're trying to get. And of course it's, it can be competitive in, um, in fun ways like that as well. Colleen, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we are up to our time limit, um, but we are certainly welcome to stay and um, continue to share some things with anyone who is able to do so. We did have a couple people who needed to leave. Sure. But, um, okay, well, we I can here as long as you'd like to stay with us. What's that? I said we are here as long as they would like to stay and learn a little more. Absolutely. Well, that said, 
Um, I wonder too, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, I wonder if you might want to go ahead and, and do some of your closing words and we can end the recording, but then certainly people could hang out for a few minutes more if they would like. Okay, absolutely. And um, do you want me to stop sharing and give it back to you, Leanne? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So, so that you can show us the um, slides again. Yeah, I just have to get back there. And present. And this is back to our original quotes. An hour has gone by way too fast. Yes. Than we even thought that it would. How did it get so late so soon? So we hope that we have met our goals in providing efficient in improvements and streamlining classroom processes through the use of Google-based interactive technology tools. Before you head out, you might have noticed that in the chat room, I already posted a link to our webinar wise guide with tips and tools to help you out. It actually goes through each of the three tools that we have included um, in our presentation, as well as some additional challenge ideas for how you can use them to enhance your curriculum and also to see how they fit with our frameworks and ISTE standards. So. Are there any questions? Do you want to do some playing with Lippity? <laughs> I think I'm going to jump in for just a moment to let everybody know that we are at the top of the hour and I'm going to um, go ahead and pause the recording here. Certainly anybody who would like to uh, continue hanging out, they are welcome to do that. You're getting some kudos over there in the chat room. Uh, so certainly thank you uh, to everyone who was here with us for the hour and who may have joined in or had to drop in or drop out or who are happen to be watching the recording later. So let me formally thank uh, Colleen and Leanne uh, for your presentation tonight. And if people would like to stick around for a few extra minutes and ask any questions or get any more demos, I think that you're both willing to stay, right? Yes, yeah, we are. Absolutely. We, we are um, very grateful for everybody to have joined us. And if you are willing to stay for a few minutes with questions, we'll certainly answer them. All right, thanks.